this video, we're going to uh, start our discussion of gases, which is chapter 10 in our textbook. Uh, so we're, switch we're uh, skipping from chapter 4 to chapter 10. We'll be back uh, in chapter 5 after this. Uh, but we want to talk about gases and some of the characteristics of gases and ways in which gases are different from solids and liquids. Uh, most notably, uh, gases have variable volumes. That is to say, you they will expand uh, to fill whatever container you put them in, and they're very compressible. So if you think about a, a syringe that you've got the end stopped on, you can sort of you can pull that syringe out to increase the volume. You can compress that uh, plunger in to decrease the volume. Uh, we can change the volume of gases. Uh, the other thing about gases is that compared to liquids and solids, they've got very low densities. So whereas liquids and solids, we generally measure density in grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter. For gas densities, we generally express those in grams per liter. Um, any sample of a gas, this is, a, this is also a difference that gases have from liquids and solids, that any sample of a gas, regardless of what that gas is, whether it's nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide, methane, any gas, uh, is going to be characterized by four physical variables, and it's going to obey um, some laws with regard to these physical variables, re again, regardless of what the gas actually is. And those four physical vari variables are pressure, which we'll talk about in more detail in just a second, volume, which is generally going to be measured in liters, temperature. We're always going to express temperature when it comes to gases in kelvins, because the laws that govern gas behavior uh, are absolute, have to do with absolute temperature and absolute volumes and things like that. So we have to use the absolute temperature scale, which is Kelvin. And then the amount of substance, which is going to be expressed in moles. So pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles. So let's spend some more time talking about pressure because this is something that we haven't talked about in class yet. Um, pressure is defined as force per unit area. And you may uh, recall that in the English system, pressure, say tire pressure, is expressed as pounds per square inch. So pounds is a unit of force. The square inch is a unit of area. So from that experience, you can kind of get your brain around the fact that the pressure is defined as force per unit area. Um, the atmospheric pressure is essentially just the weight of a column of air um, on a particular point on the on a particular uh, area on the Earth's surface. And so here's just a sort of an illustration of that. Um, pressure as an SI unit, because it's force per unit area, the SI unit of force is the Newton. Uh, because the SI unit of length is a meter, then the SI unit of area would be the square meter. So uh, the Pascal is defined as one Newton per square meter. That turns out to be a pretty small unit. Um, in fact, uh, a, because it's such a tiny, because it's such a small unit, we define the bar as being ten to the fifth pascals. That is a hundred thousand pascals, and a bar is still slightly less than standard atmospheric pressure. And so. Um, and so as a result, we don't use, although these are the SI units of pressure, we don't normally use them in the laboratory. What we do use is a system that was devised before the SI system in which we're measuring pressure based on its ability to push against a column of mercury. And so here's, so let's talk about that. Here is a sort of schematic photograph of what's called a barometer. And I actually have a barometer a mercury barometer hanging on the wall in our lab. I need to do something about getting it calibrated so that it's measuring pressures correctly. But a barometer basically uh, measures a gas's ability based on its pressure to push uh, a column of mercury against a vacuum. And so here's an example, uh, again, a schematic of a, of a barometer. You have a, a evacuated tube with a column of mercury in it that is immersed in a pool of mercury. And then the atmospheric pressure is pressing down on the mercury. Nothing is pressing down in terms of 
air pressure on the inside, the only thing that's the only downward force here is the is the weight of the mercury itself. And so um, you, and so you measure the pressure of the atmosphere based on the height of the column. And so um, and and one atmosphere is defined as being um, 760 millimeters of mercury. So it's standard atmospheric pressure. Um, if you've got a column of mercury in an evacuated tube in a pool of mercury, this H, which is the distance that it's pushing the mercury up the column um, above the top of the pool of mercury that's exposed to the atmosphere, would be 760 millimeters. Let's talk about that um, in a little more detail. Standard atmospheric pressure is defined as 760 millimeters of mercury. You, you, you may, if you like to watch the Weather Channel, hear them talking about uh, air pressures in terms of inches of mercury. That's the same system. So a barom in fact, later on the slide, we'll get to that. A barometer can be measured in inches of mercury as well as in millimeters of mercury. But when you hear that, now perhaps you understand what they're talking about. It's it's how high the atmosphere at that pressure is pushing a column of mercury against a vacuum. And so one atmosphere is defined as exactly 760 millimeters of mercury, and that is standard atmospheric pressure. So I don't have any I don't have any zeros after this. I don't have a decimal place here because these are exact numbers. So you, these have infinite significant figures. Well, there's another name for a millimeter of mercury, and that's called a tor, uh, named after a guy that did a lot of the science back in the 19th century. His last name was Torricelli. And so they named the unit after him. It's called a tor. One millimeter of mercury is exactly equal to one tor. And therefore, you can just substitute one of these into the other, and you'll find that one atmosphere which is the standard atmospheric pressure is equal to 760 torr. That is also an exact number with infinite significant figures. Um, I mentioned that there that a that a bar or a or a hundred thousand pascals is slightly less than one atmosphere. So one atmosphere is actually equal to 101,325 pascals, which would be 1.013 bar. As I mentioned before, we typically don't use these units. Um, main thing that you're gonna have to remember is these. It's essentially that if the tor is equal to a millimeter of mercury, so we use those terms interchangeably, and that there are 760 tor or 760 millimeters of mercury in one atmosphere. Some other units um, from the English system, um, one atmosphere is equal to 14.7 PSI, that's pounds per square inch. Um, that's not an exact number, and one atmosphere is equal to 29.92 inches of mercury. So when you hear them talking on the Weather Channel about press, air pressure being um, expressed in inches of mercury, essentially 30 inches is equal to one atmosphere. Okay, we've talked about the barometer, which is used to measure atmospheric pressure. Let's talk now about what's called a manometer, which is used to measure the pressure of a gas sample. And this is what's known as an open-ended manometer. And so what you have here is a gas sample in a flask, which is exposed to one end of, in a U-tube of a column of mercury, and then the other end is exposed to the atmosphere. And so, as you can see in this case, um, the gas that we have in the flask is actually pushing harder on the mercury in the U-tube than the atmosphere is because the mercury is higher on this side. And so the difference in pressure between atmospheric pressure and the pressure of the gas is equal to this height. And that's what this, that's what this um, um, equation is telling you here. The pressure of the gas is equal to atmospheric pressure plus this delta H, the height of, of the column here above the height of the column here. And because this is higher on the atmosphere side, this is going to be P atmosphere plus pH. If it was higher over here and lower over here, it would be P atmosphere minus pH because the, in that case, the, the atmosphere would be pressing harder if this side was lower than that. Okay, so the manometer is used to measure the difference in pressure between atmospheric pressure and that of a gas sample. 
And so we're really going to use an open-ended manometer like this when the when the pressure of the gas sample is some relatively close to atmospheric pressure. So in this case, I did the calculation and figure out the difference between 136.4 and 103.8 is 36.2 millimeters or 36.32.6 torr. And so that's what H is equal to. And therefore, in this case, if if it was a day in which atmospheric pressure was 760 torr, then the pressure of this gas would be 792.6 torr. So again, we use an open-ended manometer to, to, uh, to measure pressures of gases whose pressures are fairly similar or near to atmospheric pressure. We can also use what's called a closed-end manometer, and in that case, the closed end is evacuated. So this is very similar to a barometer. And so now we have the gas, and it's, it's, it's always going to be the case that if I have something in here, it's going to be pressing down, and this side's going to be lower than this side because it's pressing against a vacuum. So if this was a totally evacuated uh, chamber, these two things would be equal to each other. If there's any pressure here at all, it's going to press down, and I'm going to have a delta H. And because it's pushing against a vacuum, then the pressure inside this flask is simply equal to the value of, of H here. And so we tend to use a closed-end manometer for measuring the pressure of gas samples that are relatively close to zero. So let's just go back over these devices and what they're used for. A barometer is used to measure atmospheric pressure. An open-ended manometer is used to measure uh, samples of gas sample pressures that are near atmospheric pressure. And then a closed-end manometer is going to tend to be used to measure samples who are near zero. And so, of course, if something was in between, halfway in between zero and atmospheric pressure, you could use either an open-ended manometer. But if it's closer to closer to atmospheric pressure, you would use an open-end manometer. If you, it was closer to, to zero, you would tend to use a closed-end manometer. Something like this could pop up on a QOD. All right, so let's just go back and remind ourselves that any sample of gas, regardless of what the identity of that sample is, uh, in other words, regardless of what substance we're talking about, is going to be characterized by four physical variables. And we've mentioned again that these are pressure, which we've just spent a lot of time talking about, volume, temperature, always expressed in Kelvins, and the number of moles of the gas. And in fact, all four of these, for any gas, all four of these variables are connected by an equation that we call the ideal gas equation. And historically, um, experimental scientists had figured out that volume was uh, inversely proportional to pressure. Volume, the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to its pressure, is directly proportional to the number of moles of gas present, and is directly proportional to temperature. And so that is expressed here. We can, because we can always take a proportional sign and turn it into an equal sign simply by sticking in a proportionality constant. And this is what is known as R, which is called the ideal gas constant. We can rearrange this equation to give the form that it is pretty much always expressed in uh, just by convention, which is that PV is equal to NRT. So for any gas sample, the pressure times the volume is going to be equal to the ideal gas constant times the number of mole times the temperature expressed in Kelvins. Well, this arises from a series of what are called um, um, empirical gas laws, which in, in other words, these things were observed by various scientists toward the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. I'm kind of teaching this to you in reverse, giving you the ideal gas equation first, and then talking about the empirical gas laws that kind of fall out of this. One of the empirical gas, oh, before we get there, let's just talk about the units of R. Um, PV equals NRT, we can rearrange that uh, to say that R is equal to PV over NT, and therefore the units of R are simply going to be units of pressure times units of volume over number of moles times temperatures expressed in Kelvin. 
But you'll see that for all these things that are mentioned here, the denominator is always in moles, uh, in mole kelvins. The numerator is going to depend on what pressure unit we're using and what volume unit we're using. So most commonly, we will use liters for volume and atmospheres for pressure. And so if that's the case, then the value of R is equal to 0.08206 or 0.0821. We were just talking about the fact that there are 760 torr in, a, in an atmosphere. So if we, instead we express pressure in torr, so instead of liter atmospheres, we use liter torr, we get to 62.36 as the numerical value. If we use the SI units in which pressure are pascals and volume is equal to cubic meters, we would get this, pascal cubic meters per mole Kelvin. That is the SI unit, which is little star, which is 8.314 pascal cubic meters per mole Kelvin. It turns out that a pascal cubic meter is equal to a joule, which is the SI unit of energy. And so it is also the case, and this will come up later in the, in the year, that the value of R is equal to 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Well, let's talk about the empirical gas laws. Boyle's law uh, is just based on the empirical observation that for a fixed amount of gas at constant temperature, uh, the volume is inversely proportional to pressure. So what we're showing here is that at atmospheric pressure, um, this particular sample of gas has a volume of 60 milliliters. If I double the pressure, so that is now double atmospheric pressure, uh, the volume of that gas shrinks down to 30 milliliters. So double the pressure and the volume is cut in half. They're inversely proportional to each other. You can graph pressure versus volume. You'll get a curve like this. If you uh, graph volume versus reciprocal pressure, you will get a straight line. So that means, so that's what an inverse proportion is, that, that uh, one constant is directly proportional to the reciprocal of the other constant. Well, let's get to the meat of why, of how Boyle's law is useful to us. So, because PV is equal to nRT, if we hold N and T constant, that is for a fixed amount of gas at constant temperature, then PV is simply going to be equal to a constant. R is always a constant. If we hold N and T constant, then PV is simply equal to a constant. Since that's true, since at fixed temperature, uh, any pressure in, and under any circumstances of pressure and volume, it's always going to come out to the same constant. We can set condition one equal to condition two and say that P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. And the way that a, the form in which a problem would present itself would be you have a gas at a fixed temperature that has this pressure at this temperature. I now change the, I'm sorry, it has a, this pressure at this volume. I now decrease the volume to such and such. What is the new pressure? And so you're typically going to see a problem in which you're given three of these four variables and ask for the fourth. Another empirical gas law is Charles's law. Charles's law is something that we can just kind of intuitively understand, and that is that if you take a balloon and you heat it up, the balloon gets bigger. You take a balloon and you put it in the freezer, the balloon gets smaller. So for a fixed amount of gas at constant external pressure, the volume is going to be directly proportional to its absolute temperature. That is its temperature. And so if I graph temperature versus volume for a fixed amount of gas at a fixed pressure, I will get a straight line plot. So let's just think about how that relates to the ideal gas equation. Since PV is equal to nRT, if I hold P and N constant, so if I hold P and N constant, and so therefore I want to get all my constant uh, uh, values over on the same side of the equal sign. So I'm going to divide both sides by P. I'm going to divide both sides by T. That tells me that volume divided by temperature is equal to a constant because volume divided by temperature is equal to NR over P. And if I'm holding N and P constant, and volume over temperature is going to be equal to a constant. Once again, I can set for two different 
conditions, I can set them equal to each other because that constant is going to remain. And so initial volume times initial temperature is equal to final volume times final temperature. So you might get a problem that says um, a particular sample of a gas at constant pressure had this volume at this temperature. The temperature was changed to some other thing. What is the new volume? So that's a typical example of a Charles's law problem. Finally, there's what's known as Avogadro's law. And this is a fairly straightforward thing to understand intuitively. Um, at constant temperature and pressure, volume is going to be directly proportional to the number of moles of gas. And this makes sense. If I take a balloon and I start blowing it up and the external temperature remains same and the external pressure remains the same. As I blow more air into it, the volume of the balloon is going to increase. So volume is directly proportional to the number of moles of gas. And so if we go through this again, since PV is equal to NRT, if I'm going to hold pressure and temperature constant and look at the relationship between volume and number of moles, I'm going to divide both sides by N. I'm going to divide both sides by P. That's going to give me V over N equals RT over P. If I'm holding T and P constant, RT over P becomes a constant. V over N is equal to a constant. Therefore, I can set initial and final conditions equal to each other. And I get this, I get this version of Avogadro's law, which would be useful to you in solving a problem. OK, we'll talk about these empirical gas laws uh, in much more detail in class. Uh, QOD would tend to focus on what the what these uh, four properties are and some things about uh, pressure and measuring pressure. Thanks for watching.